Hi, everybody. Now we're going to um, take this idea that we looked at in two dimensions and consider it in a uh, high general number of dimensions. So, uh, and that's the idea that our data, uh, we think of it as a collection of points in a very high dimensional space. And we want to try to choose a direction in that space, a score, which will, uh, where the if we project the data onto that direction, we get the maximum amount of variance because that score is going to help us to tell the individual data points apart as well as possible. So um, let me draw a sort of a picture here. So remember that our data, as always, is in a data matrix X, which has N rows, K columns, the rows are samples, the columns are features. And I'm going to assume here um, that our, our data is centered. So the columns sum to zero, and I don't have to add the extra column of ones. So um, one way to think about this is that each row of our matrix gives a point in RK corresponding to its features. And so our, our points, our n points, are a cloud of points in this k-dimensional vector space. So we drew a picture of that here. This is my impression of that. Here's the cloud of points, and it's sitting in a very high dimensional vector space. And um, if we choose and, and, and not only that, they're, they're centered at zero at the, at the origin of this high dimensional space because the, um, uh, the coordinates are centered. The features are centered. And now what, when we pick a direction in this high dimensional vector space, so that's a direction U. So how do we pick a direction? U is going to be a unit vector in RK, which points in a particular direction. And we know from our earlier work that the variance of our data in the U direction is calculated by taking U transpose D0 U, where D0 is 1 over N X transpose X. This is the covariance matrix. And what this is actually measuring is it's taking, as we saw before, it's taking this direction U in this high dimensional vector space, and it's projecting all the points onto that direction or by sort of orthogonal projection. And then you get a bunch of points spread out along this line pointing in the U direction, and you're taking the sum of the squares divided by N of those points, and that's the variance in the u direction. And the reason we take a unit vector is because if we were to scale u in this expression, you see we would just scale the variance. If we scaled u by lambda, we would scale the variance by lambda squared, and we want to look at this all on an even footing, so we, um, we, we assume from the beginning that our, uh, our directions are given by unit vectors. And, and this, is, um, this is pretty standard. Okay, and the question is, how do we find U, the direction, where sigma squared U is maximum? And this should start to be sounding familiar because once again, we are confronted with an optimization problem. And so the usual way you do such a problem is you, you take the derivative and you set it equal to zero. 
But um, this isn't a completely straightforward optimization problem because we also have a constraint. Here, we have to have u equal to 1. Otherwise, this problem doesn't make a lot of sense because it would, this sigma squared, you wouldn't have a maximum if u was allowed to grow. So we force u to stay on this sphere in k-dimensional space, and we want to find where on that sphere is the point where this u transpose d0u is maximized. And um, this is what's called a constrained optimization problem. And there's a standard technique for solving them, and that's called Lagrange multipliers. And the way uh, Lagrange multipliers works is you take your objective function, which is the thing you want to minimize, or maximize, And you take your constraint, which you write in the form g equals to 0. This is your constraint. And you're only interested in solutions where your constraint function is satisfied. And you form the function s of x lambda, which is f minus lambda g. And you minimize this. You take the derivatives of this. So you're, in, you're going to have the derivatives of s with respect to xi. And you're going to have one other condition, the derivative of s with respect to lambda, which is the constraint. Because when you take, well, up to sine, when you take the derivative of this function with respect to lambda, you just get g equals 0, which is your constraint. Um, if you studied this in multivariate calculus, you've probably seen how it worked. If you haven't, um, I'm going to sort of postpone this, and we can talk about separately where Lagrange multipliers comes from. But this is the method that we want to apply. And in our case, our constraint, sorry, our objective function is sigma squared of u, which is u transpose d0 u. And um, we can actually write that out because it's, remember our variables here are u. So we have u1 up to uk. And then we have the matrix whose entries are, let's call them dij. And then we have our uh, variables u1 up to uk again. And if you go through uh, the multiplication, the matrix multiplication, you have that d0 u1 down to uk is a, this is a k by k matrix times a k by 1. So it's a vector. And it's a vector whose entries are the sum as j goes from 1 to k of d i j u j. And so when you multiply that, when you take the dot product of that with u1 down to uk, and here you have the matrix sum j goes from 1 to k d i j u k, here i goes from 1 to k, what you get is you get u1 times the sum of d1, sorry, this should be uj, d1juj, plus u2 times the sum of d2juj, plus u3, and so on. And if you put that all together, what you get is it's a double sum uh, of, let's say, r going from 1 to k and s going from 1 to k of ur, 
D R S U S. And this is our function, this is our objective function. And uh, you notice it's just a quadratic function. I mean, the highest power of any, you just have products of different u's with these coefficients drs. And I've written the drs in the middle, but these are just numbers, so you could rearrange them if you wanted. And also you have the constraint, which says that u squared has norm 1, and that is just the constraint that u1 squared plus plus uk squared equals 1. But in our Lagrange multipliers formulation, we're supposed to write our constraint equal to 0. So in other words, our constraint function g of u1 up to uk is u1 squared plus and so forth plus uk squared minus 1. And so our function s of u 1 u k lambda is the sum over r goes from 1 to k, the sum over s goes from 1 to k, u r d r s u s minus lambda times u1 squared plus uk squared minus 1. And this is what we need to take the derivatives of. So let's uh, take the derivative of s first with respect to one of the u sub i's. Well, when we take the derivative of this first sum here, what's going to happen? Well, um, we're going to get terms where u sub i appears. And u sub i could appear as either the first term or as the second term. Or it occur, could occur as both terms. So the term where, uh, where the r is i, but s is not i, is going to give us, um, for each case where r is i, but s is not i, the derivative is just going to be the drsus. So you're going to get the sum as s goes from 1 to k, drsus, uh, except that r is going to be i, because that's, the, um, the, that's how we picked out the term that corresponded to ui. And um, we're also going to get, and then there's, so that's the case where the first term is i, and the second term is s, but s is not equal to i. So here we're leaving out the case where s is equal to i. We're going to deal with that one separately. And then we also have the case where the second one is i and the first one is not. And so that's going to be a sum as r goes from 1 to k of d r i u i. And again, we're going to leave out r equal to i. And then finally, we have the term where they're both i. And in that case, we have ui squared dii. And the derivative of that is going to be 2 uii dii. And now, if we look at this carefully and we remember that d is symmetric, which means that dij equals dji, then, in fact, these two sums are exactly the same. They're the sum, uh, I mean, dis, I could turn them around and call it dsi, and then I could call s equal to r, and they're actually the same. So this is really the sum, twice the sum as s goes from 1 to k, not equal to i, D I S U S plus twice U I I D I. And this is exactly the missing term here. When S is equal to I, we would have D I I U I. So we can include it into the sum 
and when the dust finally settles, we have 2 times the sum, s goes from 1 to k, of d i s u s. But this is very nice because this was just one of the terms. If we look at the gradient of s, forgetting about the lambda term for the moment, it's the vector whose entries are 2, and each entry here is this would be the sum as s goes from 1 to k of d1sus, and this would be the sum as s goes from 1 to k of d2sus, and so forth. And that's just 2 times d0 times u from matrix multiplication. And this is a very complicated way of, it's a very complicated kind of matrix version of the idea that the derivative of, uh, in some sense, the derivative of u d0 u, this is like u squared times d0. And, it, and so it's not that surprising that the derivative would be 2 d0 u. Although we did have to make use of the fact that D is a symmetric matrix. And now we have one other term which is missing uh, because in, in doing all this calculation, uh, I forgot about this term. So I'm going to go back here and finish it up. What is missing is minus lambda 2ui because that's the term that comes out of the lambda term. So here I have minus 2 lambda ui, and here I have minus 2 lambda ui, and here I have, um, I'm going to fix this a little bit here, minus 2 lambda u1 down to uk, and so when we're all done with it, we actually, our derivative of s with respect to u1, with respect to u, I haven't done the lambda part yet, is 2 times d0 minus lambda u. And that we want to equal 0. And we have one other condition, which comes from the derivative with respect to lambda. And we already know what that is. That's the condition, well, that's u1 squared plus plus uk squared minus 1 is supposed to equal 0. And that's the condition that the norm of u squared equals 1. So the solution to our constrained optimization problem, if we forget about this 2, is has two equations to it. The first equation is that we want d0 minus lambda u to equal 0, or d0 u equals lambda u. And the second condition is that the norm of u squared equals 1. And this equation should really look familiar to anyone from linear algebra. Because this says that u is an eigenvector for d0 with eigenvalue lambda. And the second condition says that it's a unit eigenvector. So what this calculation has proven is the following theorem. The critical points of sigma u squared, which is u transpose d0 u, occur when u is an eigenvector um, maybe I should put the critical points of sigma u squared such that norm u squared equals 1 occur when u is an eigenvector for d0 with eigenvalue u, eigenvalue lambda, and norm u squared equals to 1.
And if we're interested in the maximum, I mean, what is the actual value of um, the value, the maximum variance, if you take u transpose d0u, well, d0u is lambda u, so that's u transpose lambda u, which is lambda times the norm of u squared, which is lambda. So the, the maximum variance is the largest eigenvalue of d0. The minimum variance is the smallest eigenvalue of d0. Now, all of this assumes that d0 has real eigenvalues. And for that, and that's true, d0 is symmetric. So it has real eigenvalues, as opposed to complex. We'll have to talk about that some more later. But just to recap, what we've said is we have this cloud of points in this high dimensional space. We are looking for the directions where the variance takes its largest value. And it turns out that we should take this covariance matrix, find the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue. And that's the direction in which the variance is the largest. And that variance is actually equal to the largest eigenvalue. So the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the covariance matrix are extremely interesting quantities. And we are going to talk about them some more.